Hello everyone, it's Mike Levin on Saturday, March 27th, 2021, and I want to scroll to that poem quickly and then go pull the finished product out of the oven and uh, have a real moment of discovery with the audience. There's a part of the project I've been holding back on even here as I was uh, working my way towards it, the final aha moment, such as it were. So, Linux, Python, Vim, and Git. That's my new world. Learn all of it. Of all of these, I must confide, there's only one they can't deride. Guido, GitHub, and, and soon you will VS Code to Ubuntu. Ubuntu. We own their tools, get off our chain, habits rule you, feel the pain. And so there's a lot of movement towards VS Code, and VS Code is an awesome tool. And uh, just do keep in mind, it leads a certain path which is not particularly in your interest. So my particular specialties are this Vim environment. You always see me, and I, I really love it. But I also have felt the love for notebooks and have tried from time to time to get over to VS Code because I loved the idea of um, getting rid of notebooks and just having .py files and still having a REPL environment. So I really like read eval print loop and I particularly like it with the uh, browser and uh, text box implementation uh, which is uh, the Jupyter Notebook experience in other words uh, Jupyter good many innovations And of these innovations is that feeling of making your notebooks just come alive. And uh, I'm going to really focus on these experimental coding sessions that are really fun in notebooks. And generally, I'm going to reproduce with you the fresh successes that I just had while they're fresh on my mind. And really document the thing with you guys to show you what I'm doing, guys and girls and share some brand new moments like spinning through all the data calls which i have so far been holding back on doing for real and so let's get on with it i'm gonna clear all cells oh this is the danger of binding Control shift r <laughs> to restart kernel occasionally it goes in as a control r and refreshes your whole notebook environment so i'm going to think through my key bindings but they're easy enough to change as a bonus in this video you just go to settings advanced and then you go to your keyboard shortcuts and you can see all your key bindings here and you just change it here and so it's really easy to have different key bindings when you want and it's really easy to have uh key bindings in the first place because you just copy and paste this in from say a github gist i should publish this as a github gist so you can just copy and paste it into your jupyter lab instance and have the ability to accidentally refresh instead of restarting the kernel just like i do so we get rid of settings it's not what we need at the moment this is the SEOML general framework that I've expanded significantly since the last time. I try and keep the amount of code to a minimum and I try and build in the documentation. I also went back to naming this, um, well, it is SEOML. I had it core briefly and uh, experimented, experimented with uh, just sort of leaning into the way they encourage you to do these things. But then I went back and said, hey, I really like this as being SEO ML here. And, uh, oh, that's the PY file. It's output. I take that back. Lean into the tool and make it core. And because it says SEO ML here, when it outputs its packaging files, 
The packaging files do, in fact, I went down into the logs. I'm jumping ahead in my story. The packaging files get renamed the way you want the packaging files named. It doesn't have to be named core here. But when you're in that top level directory of your repository, core is a nice place because it's your core stuff. It's what starts the whole process. And so what starts the whole process here is something that I don't expect people to import much, but the process of nbdev making documentation imports the package that this outputs as a result of this default export seoml this has the keyword export which means that this content here is what goes into the file that gets output here as this and we'll go over to that terminal world control alt t for me always which now lands me by default in the GitHub folder so that I can CD directly into my project, which is SEOML. And we can uh, CD to SEOML one more time because it's two levels deep. Standard convention for not just nbdev, but for PyPy. We can ls what's in there. And from there I can vim SEOML to prove to you that what was in that export cell is what gets exported here along with this interesting all thing and um, yeah there's a lot that I have to learn about the conventions of NB dev here I made it smaller so that I could see that entire line to see how much was going into all and by understanding what these things are I will understand the purpose of all but I can already kind of predict that they're making taking inventory of everything that gets loaded at that top level memory space in the quote package here and is making a, a, a nice directory of it uh, to be used for various things. Uh, IntelliSense, Microsoft style IntelliSense uh, type typing completion would be something that pops to mind. And uh, there's a way to sync changes that you make here back to your notebook. That will be an upcoming video. But for right now, I'll exit out of that because I don't want to have that a lock on that file in case I make notebooks again. And I alluded to the changes in the uh, log file system uh, since last time because last when last we left off, even though I had it at a minimum of lines, it still... Uh, would be writing to a log file forever larger and that's unacceptable I needed to do the log rotating and so I you know went through all the stack overflows and I decided on my own way of doing things first of all for the logging directory the directory where the logs are gonna go into you can't do much better than using the path object from path lib import path it's one of the all-purpose things you see we're hardly into the script at all before we're checking to make sure whether this location, because it's now a path object, this is relative to the repo, dot slash means inside your repo directory from here. And uh, when that code executes, it's going to uh, create that log directory relative to where it's running. I'll probably end up with two log directories, one two levels deep, you can see there it is, and one here in the actual repo itself, that's a separate logs directory because it's relative to where the notebook is running versus the .py file running. So I got to get used to the reality of two log file locations based on where it ran from. It makes sense. I check if that directory exists. If it, if it doesn't, I use that same path object create you know from pathlib it's this all purpose it's a real all purpose package of things i use it to uh you know i use the exists method of an instance of an object created from that and then i also use the make dir method of that same object to create the directory if it's not there from a path object so you know it's going to work operating system independent that's awesome this is transportable between um, platforms operating systems what have you it doesn't matter if it's windows or a mac or a linux system and then I use my own kind of style of doing things here to kind of keep things pep8 complying because I don't like my lines too long so I create a date pattern, I create a general log format pattern, and I create an abbreviation to an object in memory. That RFH is a reference to the logging handler's 
rotating file handler, which I had to add as its own separate import because one of the Python nuances, one of the just have to know things. And then I create my list of handlers. Again, you see path object things uh, in action here where you can put a directory slash another directory. This is an, an, an invented API by the path object. Normally that would be a divide by operator, but in this context, it's appending that LDR, you know, the logs location that you see right there with um, a name of log file. And it's also, uh, let's see, that's the, the, the rotator. So there's some parameters I give the rotator, like how big in bytes the file can become, the maximum number of files. And I also add a stream handler. This is a list of handlers. HLR is my short notation for a list of handlers. So the um, log file location and the uh, parameters uh, the log file location is one thing, the parameters for rotating is another, and those all are parameters that are being fed to the rotating handler. But in addition to the rotating handler, which really ends at this comma, another handler is being fed in. It's that whole thing to the left that's highlighted, plus this as a second thing in the list. So I have two handlers. So when I add my handlers here, I'm actually adding two handlers. Handlers equals both the log rotator part and the streaming part. And that way when you run this, the output that goes here is being fed both as output here and it gets this strange magenta background. So not magenta, that is uh, maroon or uh, yeah. Anyway. And it goes into your log file location, which it's running in the context of an IPython notebook there, so it's going to be in the log directory here. And there's going to be a lot of them. I'll jump to the bottom. And that line right there at the bottom is from what we just ran. And it goes on forever following those uh, rotating rules, and it'll delete its tail after leaving 10 files. So if this gets deployed to the server, the log files will never fill your server. There will only ever be 10 of your most recent uh, log files rotated, uh, older ones getting higher numbers until they delete and poof out of existence towards the end, following the, you know, file naming conventions uh, made here and the, um, it's not really file naming conventions, it's log entry conventions. All these details about knowing, you know, uh, the time stamp of when it went, the, um, type of log you're warning. It's info. I have all the infos going on in here. And then the uh, object that the action belonged to, the method of the object that the function belonged to, uh, and uh, what it uh, wants to document, what it's made to document. And a lot of times in my code, uh, I have, I, I use this log function, which does a basic, uh, I keep right clicking by accident. I might get a better pointer for when I make these videos, but I use this log function a lot, which just basically does an info level logging. And I have info level logging being committed to the hard drive as is defined here. So really I got logging right and, uh, deployable to the server. Okay, so the other main difference in this file, before I get to the main point of it, which is hitting the database, this is the build-up. So you stay with me and you learn a little thing. When I was creating the documentation for this, it was failing on uh, this file because I only had it going down from checking whether it was IPython notebook environment and then just doing an else and then executing this, which basically loaded some pickled arguments from the last time it was run as a, uh, oh no, it, it does this, which is imagining it's running from the command line. Well, no, not, it really does run from the command line and it pickles the results to the drive. So it was only I'm running from Jupyter or I'm being run from the command line. That's the way these two uh, things were working on their own. But it turns out there's this last case because when you make the documentation, NB dev uh, build docs, it imports this. And I had to create this thing here, which similarly imports um, 
the last pickled arguments. And so I guess I'll just show you that real quick. CD dot dot, clear, make it bigger, NB dev. First you build the lib, and I'm finding there's a little bit of order sensitivity to this stuff. You want to make sure you're CD'd here. If I CD into that subdirectory down, the next thing doesn't seem to work so well. We NB dev build uh, docs, and it's singular for lib, plural for docs. And there you go, it has successfully, well, in a moment, it will have successfully built the docs, which is a conversion of the index notebook, the core notebook, and it builds a readme file. And it doesn't say so, but I think it builds a, the built-in documentation for the core file. That's something I'll be delving into a lot because something I don't have a lot of here because I don't use functions a lot really, or I use anonymous functions, is the built-in documentations of functions you do put in where you can create a uh, representation, a string representation, and a doc string. And that becomes automatic documentation generally to make help files and stuff. So I'm going to try and make this a best case example of all these things, but really now that I've explained the changes up here, I'll jump to the changes uh, that make it stage the thing so well for um, completing the loop on this project, showing you the pulling it out of the oven. I'm going to execute these things one at a time to gratuitously show you how I document stuff and make use of these headline things. So we create the global resources like our H1s producing this very headline and we parse the input arguments. You can see that the input arguments are logged to the log file. Whenever we see that color, we know it's also going to a text file so we can check it later, but it will never fill the drive. And uh, I use the figlet thing, which gives the personality of this whole script the first time it runs and the assurance that setup is complete. You can get setup out of the way. That's part of the pattern. There's also a pattern of saying done, and I'm going to be saying what the next step is. You design your data model using named tuples. You could also use data classes, and I give some links for both so you can understand the difference. And you can even use full object oriented classes, but I find these to be the easiest for the use I'm, um, I'm doing. We create a subclass, and then we say uh, we create an instance of that subclass, and then we print some things out about it. And we see our ever-present H1 telling what's happening. Create a data model with name tuples or data sets. So I show a, what created, what look, at, what it looks like to do that. This is what I did. This is what I executed. And then I remind you that girls is, and then I show the string representations, which really exposes some interesting shortcomings of tuples. It's very generic. It doesn't tell you much, but this is the. Uh, class template factory, factory class. And this is an instance of that factory class, which you can at least see lives in the namespace known as main because of the way we're running it in this context. And it is, in fact, an object that lives in that namespace. It's a, that's the factory class it's showing us. The next step is to create a place to store raw data. So I moved the creating of the cache here. I always create a new cache location and I guess that's a before and after kind of thing. I'll go two screens over. I'll do Windows E to pull this thing up, go into my GitHub folder. From there, go to this folder, not rename. And then from there, go into our cache folder and show you that there's a 25, 26, and today's the 27th and I have not, um, run this today yet so i'll pull this over here and i'll use the full glory of windows 10 not that i'm a windows 10 fanboy but i do appreciate it as a platform right now look at this before and after so once that cache stuff is set up i open a connection to sql uh, which is going to be able to just let us do a dictionary where data goes in and data goes comes out persistent dictionary without further ado we run it and there you see a directory for today was created, which creates the raw data database. And I'll try and keep these tables named for uh, very close to the function that they're going to be 
you know, serving. So we've got a, per a persistent dictionary. Ho, ho, ho. Now we've got a persistent dictionary. Whether I bring this video to the use of that persistent dictionary is a question of how much endurance I have in making the video and how much patience you have in sitting here and listening to it. Next step, create a list of the data calls to be made. Okay, so I showed you this extensively on the last video. I was referring to 18 months, but with Google Search Console, it's really more typically 16 months of data that's available. So that's a parameter that gets set. And then I uh, build out a bunch of stuff. I'll run it to show you from the output what I do. I build a list of dates uh, that represent those of the last 16 months. That happens to be 486 days total. Here's the four most recent. And then here are the four oldest dates, just to give you a sample. Next, because I know the Google Search Console API, we need 10 start rows for paging through chunked data. Here are the start rows. And then I give three, three samples of how those dates of the date list is going to combine with the start rows of the stepping. And then finally, I populate a list with girls, which are instances of the GURL data type I created. That's the name tuple. So each of these is an instance of that type of named tuple where the date is every day going back from yesterday uh, set as both the start date and the end date with uh, dimensions of page being fed, a row limit always of 5,000 being fed. So this is an always value. This is an always value. And then the paging. There's start row 1, start row 5,001, 10,001, 15,001, all the way up so that we know that plus the next you know 5,000 rows or the next 4,099 rows because that's the first it'll start on will give us all 50,000 URLs that can typically be emptied out of Google Search Console for any given site. Now the site I'm going to be applying this against doesn't have anything like that amount of data. In fact, the truth is it has much less data than that and it will always end at the first day in that series. However, we'll address that in a moment. Next step, get access to source of data Google Search Console in this step. These are things I've been doing in one way or another for the past five to ten years. Closer to five because this I don't think has all been around, but since G data I've been getting Google authorization. So I get my Google authorization using this OAuth package I made and released onto PyPy to radically simplify the OAuth login process, which really just amounts to importing OAuth, which we do here, importing the Google uh, API uh, discovery client and the build function from that because we need to build uh, connections to different uh, API services. So in addition to importing OAuth and importing build, you actually need to create a statement that uses build, that you feed the API name you're using, the version of the API, the credentials object, which you create here. So you have to add this line. And I just log the REPR, the representation string output of that, which is what you see here. So whenever I do something really important that is a dramatic success, like getting credential authorization, logging in, the simp the the value of that alone is worth following these videos because, you know, that's the big hurdle getting started here. But anyway, there it is logging it. You see me that using that pattern all the time. And all my lines are as short as possible. I use that build to do what I just said right here. I silence a message uh, about the cache discovery with that line here that's new since the last time. And then this is a nice little just helper function that uh, I guess I'll be using here. Yeah, right. And I did use here to just list it. Yeah. So that's calling the service. It's just listing the sites you own under the login uh, of, the con of the account you just used. I'm not showing you actually doing the login because that's in prior videos plenty of times when this import occurs. And when, when this credentials call is made, it prompts you to do this token thing with a web browser. So anyway, 
<laughs> the last video I did, and it took a long, long time to get to this point, I created a list of URLs. Um, oh, this is no, this is just creating a ad hoc function called GSC service. It hasn't called any, it hasn't called the service yet, but I used it before uh, in the last video, and I got this dictionary call back, and I was uh, a little bit confounded. It's a tiny little dictionary, and I'm like, that should be data. And it turns out because I was using an odd number, and I wasn't on, say, 30 that it came back with no data as just a dictionary. Now you'll notice a key called rows, and in there, there's a whole bunch of rows. There's some data there, right? That's my actual real uh, site showing me <laughs> the impressive number of impressions I got on that URL for that day, the number of clicks I received from those impressions, and the position I was in, 81. So, you know, my sites are basically dormant right now. You know, I'll have a few things. It doesn't show you the keyword because I'm not asking for the query in the request, or it would be twice the number of rows for every URL for every keyword. And I don't want to deconstruct that data that small just yet. There's a bunch of other stories here I'm really skimming over, but I've been doing this stuff for so many years. I know that I just want to list enumerate through all the URLs in the site. So we've just proved here that we can do that. Now, as soon as I, if I did a, a 40, I would get a good number. If I did a 50, I would get a good number. I say number, but set of data coming back. Cause those are those on 10 increments. You see those, you know, when you're on the first step of 10 steps, cause that's, you know, the first set of data that's responding. And it turns out that it's a really bad idea to just go through all those steps and do all that uh, inefficient uh, data calls on all those things that you know are going to be empty. So there's a challenge there because when you're stepping through in a loop, yeah, and I'll just get to it. This is a yeah, okay, that did the transformation. That's showing you ahead of time, really. Uh, so I'm going to hide that for a second. And I'm going to show you that when you just... Ooh, I don't even have the bad logic that wouldn't have worked so well anymore. The temptation was, since this function returns what you want when given the simple input of a number, there's the 50 I used, but it could just as well be 60 or 70. You, you would step through for as many as you know records you have. Uh, you would just step through the whole list because you only have, you know, you can enumerate the items in a lot of girls. But the problem is after it, it comes up empty or it has less than 5,000 rows, however you want to do it, you can't use a break to move on to the next even increment of 10. There's a can't use break to go to next even increment of 10 deficiency that I seem to have encountered in the break commands in Python or uh, the continue command or what have you. So I realized that the problem was because I was thinking about stepping through the records in order as they exist in the dates object. This date, this date, this date, so all the, and I have a lot which would go to the same order that they exist in lot girls. Okay, so the lot girls object is just a flat object. So it executes the API call that that represents. It gets back some rows. It could say, oh, if less than 5,000 stop here. But what I really want to do is I want to make this call, have it come up with a response like that. Pardon me while I brighten up my keyboard here. There we go turning down my audio by accident. Okay, there we go. So instead of this data format where you can't use a break because it gets to here, it gets this response back. It knows that that means stop. You cap off the record because key value pairs for the key that you just fed in. For this key that you fed in, the data that comes out is going to look like this, and you can record that in your database. However, there really is no reason to try and fetch this one and this one and this one, because you know that the next 
eight that follow are just going to be that same response, which has no rows data set. Okay, so that is extremely useful for efficiency. All you need to do is make it so that when you say break, it jumps to the next row one. Can you say sublists? How can you take a flat list and make it so that there's a concept of nesting? I highlighted the wrong one. A concept of nesting so when you break, it breaks up to your row ones. The answer is simple. Simple. It's using the same transformation language as we use everywhere else, and that's what I hid here because it wouldn't have as much meaning to you. But now that I gave you the backstory, you can see that that is a sublist, closed list. This here is a sublist, closed list, and those are sublists of this parent list here. It's that square bracket and so on down and I just show you three I'm using the slicing method I could show you everything but it really wouldn't make sense I'm just showing you the three shows you enough it goes on this way down to cover those 400 and some records that are in here total and to now explain the last piece here before I get to the bottom line because finally we're at the end of the video you see it getting dark all around me here behind me what we do is show you that first of all enumeration is a thing right so if i got rid of the enumeration if you just did for foo in uh, that range oh it must be so painful to watch me i need to think about using a mouse on these videos i generally am against things like mice because it makes you more of a static individual for needing a mouse and for breaking your flow you should be able to use your trackpad right here on your keyboard but you know it doesn't always work out right i'm going to look into the right click parameter maybe remove that and require two fingers for a right click that could solve my problem yes so anyway that's what for foo in range three is going to give you so i do a couple of undos here and show you that the only thing different about enumerating is that you pop out an internal counter which in this case happens to produce the exact same numbers as foo in range right so to clarify that i have if I else print, and you're like, wait, zero is zero, one not zero, two not zero. How does it know that? It's because this is a truth evaluation. If, uh, if you print one, if you print zero, and you can check if zero print uh, print false if zero print true hmm okay how did I do that so anyway I don't want to get off track here, but zero always evaluates false. I guess you can uh, do bool zero, false, bool one, true. That makes the point I'm trying to make. So zero always evaluates false, while one always evaluates true, or positive numbers. If I were to do bool two, if it has a positive value, truth comes out. It doesn't matter what that number is or how many zeros it has, but if it is actually zero itself, it evaluates false, which leads us to the question, is zero false? That question, the answer is actually true because false is just syntactic sugar that ties to the numeral uh, zero. So internally, zero and false are the same thing. So you can use that when building a nice logic gate where I use the enumerate function that you'll remember from here, which makes this have a value of zero on the first row, one on the second row, two on the first, on the, th on the third row. So if I name that I value is paged, and then I say, if is paged, 
Well, that'll only evaluate true on pages beyond the first API call. So we put the actual API call here, which I simulate. This is a nonsense thing. I say empty response is what we know to be a request for the next page of data that comes up empty. So if we're on page two of the stepping through the data or not, because you remember we step through our data according to these steps, 0, 5,000, 10,000, which you see represented here in the API calls as start row 1, 5,001, 10,001. That's what's on these requests. And that means that this can only ever evaluate true on everything after the first page of responses. It can never evaluate true on this. It's listen carefully for the data. However, once you get to this one here, you now have to actually uh, be on that one there. Once you get to that one there, you actually have, if, if your response equals empty response, then break. And so, Calling this API will never actually get to a third row of data because it gets capped off by the second row of data that returns what we know to be no rows or, or empty. So I'm going to use that right now to make this entirely live call that I'm using here, right? You know, you might have lost uh, track of the uh, realization that whenever I put an even number thing in there, that actually is a call to the actual API and that's doing its thing. So there's a nice value I can replace in there called X and that's nice and short. And to the don't repeat yourself community, I would say to them, you don't, you're not using the right techniques to like abbreviate down something like this. Cause once you get the API just right, where you're only feeding it the things exactly what you need, I could even abstract this a little bit more. So you don't have to look at as dict, but to me, this is about the right amount to be looking at for a copy and paste. So you are repeating yourself, but you're doing it in a good way. So it's this logic here. I was doing, having some foo fun, uh, just showing some inside jokes on Python. Lambda spam f string foo spam bar foo bar and uh, lambda zero equals false. True, right? There's a great example of what I was talking about. Uh, we just wrote a function that <laughs> says zero equals false, which in fact evaluates true. And then we just wrapped it in the syntactical sugar that makes it a lambda function that's callable. And then we called it like that. So it exists here. Uh, that same thing, if I were to do a type on this, this is just to delay further the moment of calling the data. You could see that that's a bool. Oh, it's going to be a bool in either case because it's being called. It comes out a bool. But if I were to get rid of calling it without deleting an extra parenthesis, you would see it's a function. And this remains a bool because I can't turn that back into a function by removing you know, open close because nothing's being called inside of this simple statement. Anyway, I ramble. I need this to repeat this pattern, which I should really put immediately beneath it because we don't really need to mess around with that foo fun at all. That was a gratuitous extending of this video. Hey, boost my view times. Anyway, uh, we need this function here. And that clearly works quite well. We move it down to this loop and say it where we make the API call. Now it's not actually putting it anywhere. The database stuff is not put in here. So for want of a database, let's crash my memory. I should really do the database stuff. It's as if it's as easy as as I say, I could lift it from there, but I'm just gonna let it poof out of out of existence. I'm just gonna maybe watch for um, some sort of output. Because you have a quota, you can only do so much per day. And if you have a response, you're always gonna have a response. Let's print, you know, uh, we have a day. We have is paged 
And uh, that's an enumeration of an inner loop. I should really enumerate the outer loop so it can show us uh, a good old I. Now we can uh, print I. And we don't want to print the whole response object, except maybe the response string. That actually could be quite interesting. Uh, but it's going to be a response of this, so it's going to be... Uh, let me think that through. The whole object we don't... We really don't... We don't want... We don't want... I'm going to say the length. The length of the response. And I'm going to burn through my quotas, but, like, who really cares? And we shouldn't see ones that are after this. We should see a lot of row zeros pop up. In fact, my site's pretty small, so it's going to be zero, 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 zero. We're not going to see any of the internals, like the neat uh, URL data that was being shown back uh, in the upper place uh, where I'm using it. It's just going to poof away into non-existence, except for the last row of what it processes. So without further ado, let's try that. <laughs> And when last we left off, I guess I'm spoiling it there, it took me t quite a few tries to get it right. But what I was doing wrong is I had, you know, a simple key in here from the uh, leftover from where I copied this function from up there. This is the calling of the API. In the most simplified form I can give it, it's a member of the sublist of lot days because the day the girls the uh, g urls are organized into sublists so i have to use the outer loop for the first key and the inner loop for the second key it's a two key scenario and to so to get to each thing that gets turned into a dict we need the full index to the instance of the girl g url that we're iterating through which is right here and so with that in mind, it, and I am printing the whole response now, and it gives exactly the effect that I'm looking for on day zero, which, you know, is Google Search Console. You're not going to have a lot of data. On day one, you've got first some data, and after that data is done, you've got a blank row. Now you'll recognize here I have a print of a, a blank row on the inner loop. So there's that blank row there. It's an, e it's an easy way to tell uh, days apart. So uh, not days, but you know, result rows. This is the real data. This one caps it off. Day two, here's the real data. Goes down to here. This one caps it off. So even though that there's clearly less than 5,000 rows, I hardly have any uh, URLs real active on my site, but Regardless of how many rows uh, it ends at, which is less than 5,000, it goes to the row after that. Start row is zero. This is start row one. When it gets to start row one, it says, oh, well, that's an empty result, so I'll stop there. And in such a way, we can efficiently empty out all the data out of our, our search console. And as I pointed out to you, even though I'm scrolling to the bottom and I could keep scrolling, keeps pushing my food test down, we're not going to really need to do that because I scroll back up here and I'm going to stop it because it's poofing into non-existence. The last response object will be populated, but nothing after that. So we'll compress that. And you can see here I was experimenting with it before, getting things right for showing it with you in the video. Oh, it's still running there. So I actually want to hit this stop here. And now we should be able to execute this on its own. And there's the last row of data uh, it was up to and it had collected. So in order to not blow up my memory, I let these response rows sort of poof away. But on the next video, I'll layer in the database uh, parts, the parts that'll actually uh, bring in some of the stuff that's sitting there ready to be used. You know, this is this is it. Uh, we'll be taking code from here, uh, lifting it up and working it into the loop 
over here so that all the data as it spins through a thing like this is emptied out in NoSQL style in the key value database. And then when we go back and look at it, we have a couple of options. We can either step through the tuples and use the same logic uh, to just hit the tuples that we know there's going to be data on. Or we can step through every record in the database and just know what we're going to be encountering. Sometimes we'll be encountering you know, um, responses that have uh, empty, you know, that have empty. We just know the meaning of this. It's like, oh, there's no data in there. So we step through and we just essentially skip over all the empty rows. And uh, do aggregate functions? Aggregate? No. We just add those. We flatten it. We uh, row and columnize it. Yeah, that's what we do. We do a transform to turn all this data into rows and columns so we can use more traditional SQL on it than would be implied from this JSON object. Although things like MongoDB are all a, an option here, but I think we'll take things to row and column world and make it look a lot more like uh, an Excel spreadsheet and sort of uh, format things for deliverables. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Probably one of the most clean and efficient ways to hit all your pages of Google Search Console to empty out all your data into a local database. That'll be the next video. Uh, but what clean code to do this. I can't wait to clean this up and to make it just part of the, uh, the template of this whole project. A task that every Webmaster, data master, SEO needs to do whatever you call yourself these days. This is that data collection stuff that's in common to almost all data science projects where so much of it is just gathering it, knowing where to grab it, how to grab it, how to collect it. So there's a great template here. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.